Hi, Jonathan and Jason. Good afternoon, everybody. As I see, we're blowing up here. Uh, what, what's not surprising? Um, so I'm going to introduce Lynn in just a second, but just to go, um, food is on its way, but we'll probably do that in the Q&A session afterwards, and it'll be hosted outside. Because the room is blowing up as it's today, we are going to live stream to the internet and to the sitting area just outside. You can sit right outside and watch and listen to everything. <laughs> and if that blows up, we have another conference room at 237 down the hall, and that will be hooked up as well. So you, you don't have to. In fact, I'm recommending you don't stand in the back because it's like fire hazard. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I think you're more or less ready to run. We are our, um, internet, We are recording and are transmitting to the internet, and there is a microphone on the ceiling, so don't say anything I wouldn't. <laughs> Very good. With that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's get us started, because I came here for the show, and I think it'll be a good one. So, Leonard Davolio. Yeah. Um, the first time I met you was at the National Academy of Medicine meeting, Digital Learning Collaborative, talking about the potential future of data and AI and medicine. I had no idea who he was. He gave a presentation at the time. I was like, wow, that was, that was cool. That was crisp. Watched many videos on, on YouTube as well. And what he just says is a great way, very practical perspective. Um, president at Harvard, but also a CEO of a health tech um, company, and really able to encapsulate things, I think, in a very pragmatic, crisp way, to the point that if uh, Plagiarism is the sincerest form of flattery. You know that I have absolutely stolen many things. <laughs> I am definitely using it from now on. Um, it's a fantastic way to do that. With that in mind, um, I'm just going to take away and not take your time. Please take away, Lane. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, um, I mean, if you're on this here and you're going to talk to me, this, you know, this one, uh, this one's personal. This is sort of my journey the last 15 years. So, um, to be able to be invited to talk to all of you is um, is a real honor. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk not about building algorithms, but what does it take to make them actually work? And uh, for me, my journey started 16 years ago when I was newly married and my wife and I filled up a car and drove out to the West Coast. We went to UCLA for me to pursue a PhD uh, focused on, I was into software and what tech could do, but I, I was kind of bored with helping to do like finance and retail, and I thought, well, healthcare is cool, right? Do well by doing good or whatever we say in healthcare. So I, I learned machine learning, natural language processing. I learned of all these wonderful problems. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it, but I was, I was pretty excited. I knew that I needed data, and I knew that I needed uh, access to technology, and so I took a postdoc back in Massachusetts. And so off we went again, this time with my daughter, who's now 14 years old and here with me today. Her first trip back to the West Coast since she was born here. And um, uh, I was at BU and the VA because I knew that they had data and they had tech. And um, you know, within two weeks of getting home, <clears throat> the reason I always leave this out of my talk, um, my wife is diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, so, um, you know, this is really influential for so many reasons because when, <laughs> when, when someone you love is diagnosed with a serious illness, uh, you, you have to make a lot of decisions really quickly related to her care. Um, and so as a newly minted PhD, what do you do? You, you go to the research to figure out what's been done. Uh, it's not only what to do, but the sequence of what to do. It all comes at you so quickly. And what you realize very quickly when someone you love is ill is that um, the doctors don't have all the answers. And if someone you love is ill with cancer at the age of 32, the literature doesn't have all the answers um, because most of the research is been focused on older people. Um, the crazy thing was I had been working in oncology data, and I knew that my wife was not the only 32-year-old to deal with this disease. I knew that hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. have been through this. And I knew that the data described, you know, the three most fundamental questions of improving anything, like what are we doing, and is it working, and what should we do? And so for me, this gave me a real sense of purpose. Uh, everything about my career since that day has been focused on helping healthcare answer those three fundamental questions. Um, I've taken on a series of projects over the last, who I guess, 15 years or so to try to help healthcare answer those three questions. But every single project I've been a part of has been focused on impact. And so 
I want to make clear that there's lots of ways to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare. There's not as many ways to use them to have impact. Um, I mean, if you're interested in using them to make money, go and buy it. <laughs> uh, there's a lot easier ways to make money. Um, so, um, so uh, the next the series of, you know, I, I don't even think of them as jobs so much as a sequence of projects, but the sequence of projects that I was grateful to, to have the sponsorship of, of, the, uh, of the icons listed, but it's really, you know, every one of them was sort of building on. I mean, I started as a researcher because I thought, we have to figure out what these tools can and can't do, machine learning, natural language processing, and I was publishing papers. But papers were a means to an end, and then I started creating open source software, and we started hosting that software and tutorials and open source data sets at UCSD and elsewhere because we wanted everyone. We thought if we could sort of teach a man to fish, uh, then, then uh, everyone could use these technologies. Um, then over time, I started to work. You know, I took uh, money from sort of philanthropies and pseudo philanthropies, and within the government, I was building out teams that could use these technologies. And what you realize when you do this work, if your goal is truly impact, there's data, there's technology, but without incentive, you can publish papers, right? With incentive, remember, incentive is the difference between one person reading your paper and a lot of people changing their behavior in the healthcare system to do something different. And so it's not until just the last few years that it made sense for me to take this mission and create a for-profit uh, and so my last four and a half years have been focused on uh, creating a company, which is all the way to the right. So uh, I think the first thing I want to convey to you is that for the first time in a very long time in the U.S. healthcare industry, these stars are starting to come into alignment. Um, we have technology, we have data, and increasingly we have incentives. So let's, let's talk about that real quick. Number one, when I started, we weren't calling it AI. I mean, I wish we didn't uh, start calling it AI. It was just machine learning. There were Java packages that we could download and use to do this work. Nowadays, this stuff is so widely available that if you put in your medical subdiscipline of interest in the words machine learning, the screen, Google Scholar, the screen will fill with all the questions that have already been attempted, uh, at least with machine learning. So we have it probably now, I think one of the first papers I wrote, I cited the fact that it's been 40 years since we started doing studies that showed that machine learning could discover interesting patterns in healthcare. And 40 years later, people you know, were still not quite there. So we have data. Just 10 years ago, the rate of adoption of electronic health records was near 10%. Now that number is over 90, 95% because you know, during that Great Recession, the Obama administration created incentives, sort of carrot and stick. If you adopt an electronic health record, you get $17,000 per adopting clinician. If you don't, four years later, you get dinged $4,000. So overnight, this sort of carrot and stick incentive system just gave us data like we've never had in the past. And we have incentive. We are spending so much money on health care, and the return on that investment is not good. In study after study, the U.S. is ranked bottom in terms of developed nations, in terms of the quality of the health care we provide. And the crazy thing that's happened, I don't know that the Obama and the Trump administrations agree on anything except value-based care. Because when Trump took office, I actually was pretty worried that this whole value-based care thing was going to go right back to pure fee-for-service, we were going to shutter the CMMI, and we weren't going to do these value-based contracts anymore. Is everyone here familiar with the two major ways in which healthcare is paid for today? It's either fee-for-service, which means we're giving you money based on the amount of care you deliver and the complexity of care you deliver, or it's some kind of value-based construct, and we'll talk about that. That means a lot of things depending on the flavor of the contract, but the principle is basically I'm going to give you more or less money based on your ability to do this, uh, at a high quality and preferably at a lower cost. So those are the two ways we, like that's the only healthcare policy lecture you're going to get during the talk, <laughs> but that's the two ways in which we pay for healthcare. And the number of people now covered under value-based care is rising. So we have incentive for the first time. When you have data, technology, incentives, you know, private equity and venture capital, pay attention. And I don't know if you, I mean, this is Stanford. You've seen the amount of money that has flowed into some of your faculty and, and all of the companies that are born around here to do technology and healthcare. 
and the numbers are going through the roof. We're breaking records in terms of the amount of venture dollars being invested. And it's not just a new company. The big guys are getting involved too. So, by all accounts, it feels like we've got this problem solved. And yet, I don't know if all of you have been reading the headlines, but there's a real sort of backlash against AI in healthcare. There, there is a, I think, an impression that we've oversold what this can do. And you're seeing now real projects start to fall apart. Maybe because they couldn't find the right problem to solve, maybe because of what they sold. But I'm seeing headline after headline start to warn that, hey, maybe this isn't what we thought it was. Maybe this thing that I've dedicated my career to isn't that big a deal. Um, we're even talking about this in dire straits, like warnings of a dark sign in AI and healthcare. Uh, so, this talk, for the amount of time I have left, this is a collection of lessons learned trying to have impact. Not about doing the math, it's about what happens after the algorithm. And I think it's important, you know, I always feel a little guilty when you give these talks about all of these, like, I know the way to do it. Be clear, anyone who does that and their lessons are worth learning, like, has paid the price. Everything I'm about to show you is landmines that I have stepped on. And if you're going to go down this road, be prepared to make a lot of mistakes. That's, that's part of this gig. Um, but here it is, my hit list of mistakes. This is things that I wish I had known sooner in my career. Number one, <clears throat> help people understand what it is and isn't when we say AI and healthcare. Now I'm speaking to a highly educated number of people. You all know exactly what it is. AI and healthcare is robotic doctors. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course it isn't. And I, just a quick sidebar. I don't know when this guy became the unofficial mascot. <laughs> uh, and I mentioned that, and someone said in another field said, well, it's not just healthcare. And I said, well, what do you mean? And I said, what do you mean? He's in the <laughs> <laughs> Here he is. Uh, <laughs> with his ET finger manipulating the matrix or something. I, he might be going into the male modeling business. <laughs> with his really suave there. <laughs> Also, this is a consistent theme here, like human versus machine is also a really popular uh, theme to run with in the AI business. And here he has spray painted his face silver to horrify this small <laughs> um, You know, I joke about it, but it matters because each and every one of you is becoming skilled in your craft and you're going to take all these lessons learned. And you, you do this in a rigorous way and you know how to evaluate the results. And you're going to be in the room with clinicians and executives, and you're going to think that what you're telling them is the most brilliant thing they've ever heard. And because of this sort of media blitz of AI versus doctor and robotic humanoids, because of that, you need to go into it aware of the fact that they may not perceive you in the same way. <laughs> uh, and this matters. So, the first lesson is start every engagement. If you are lucky enough to work with clinicians to do something that matters, start every engagement helping them understand what this is and what it isn't. And I would like to see if we can gain some consensus now in our time together about what this is and isn't. Number one, artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor <laughs> intelligent. I, I'd like to start saying machine learning again, like I used to when I was getting my degree. Um, it's really, in 99, 5, 95% of the time, it's supervised machine learning and big data. But that's because it's misnamed. There's still plenty of AI work that is about intelligence. Sure. But, but I agree with you, most of it is, is mislabeled. But when we apply it in health, in most of the applications I've been a part of to try to take data and make it work, and they're saying AI. Sure. It's been, this, this also... But there's, been, there's been plenty of work in, in medicine, too, that is really AI and not machine learning. Sure. It, but, but certainly that's of public perception and you're right to try and correct. Point data. Um, when we say big data in this field, we mean finally using the data we've had. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in healthcare, that means electronic health records. Uh, depending on the environment you're in, it could mean care management data. Uh, I think it's really interesting that these days we're talking about social determinants of health as though that's a data set that you purchase and it solves all problems. <laughs> but in any case, you know, big data is just, let's, let's start to use that data that we've had forever. Uh, so, if indeed we're talking about machine learning, then I think we also have to acknowledge it's a capability, it's not a product. 
Uh, when we say AI is black box, and these are very popular headlines, they may be written slightly differently depending on what you're reading, it's not ready for prime time, AI needs to be regulated, AI is biased, I challenge you to replace the word AI with math, um, <laughs> because then it becomes a little silly to talk about AI as black box, AI needs to be regulated. You need to speak about whatever this technology is you're using in terms of the very specific approach you're taking and its pros and cons and the very specific application you are using it for because I don't want AI to be regulated if it means it's restocking the shelves with gauze pads outside of an operating room. I do want it to be regulated if it's deciding when to push a bolus of insulin for someone with diabetes. And so it's really hard for the public to have these debates as to what what needs to be done without getting more narrow as to what is the problem and how are we attempting to solve it. That's the second thing that I think is holding us back a little bit. Um, I think a better metaphor, a metaphor that I have found works in these environments where I'm trying to help people come up to speed is this set of technologies allows us to analyze, predict, and personalize. Don't think robotic humans, think like Google Maps, getting between point A and point B. We all have a job to do, whatever that job is. As a driver, it's getting between point A and point B. We used to have static maps, it was our view of the world. Now by understanding what is happening all around us, big data, we can understand so where is the traffic slower, where are the busy police positioned, and so on and so forth. We can say, well, based on 10,000 people that went this way in a moment like this, like you, uh, you know, they're, they'll save two minutes if they take Route A versus Part B. And finally, if you know who I am, if you know the problem I'm trying to solve, you can create a recommendation that's a little more personalized. I like to stop at Starbucks on my way to work. Maybe I cost myself five more minutes. Now, think about all the problems that this can be applied to in the field of health. By right? analyzing, predicting, and personalizing in this information science that is healthcare, there's really no limitation to what this could do. This is why, to me, this is so exciting, is because I think this is not product. This is a new way of learning. And the organizations in other industries that have figured out how to transform their industries have done so because they placed learning and incremental improvement at their core. Everything is built up around that. In the case of Walmart, it's not just how to price products or where to preposition them, it's where to park the forklift at the end of a shift to save two minutes a day multiplied by 10,000 factories and 20,000 employees and so on and so forth. The thing that got Amazon excited about machine learning was not the opportunity to go out and buy a third-party population bookselling tool that every single bookseller used, like a risk score in healthcare. It was placing learning at the core of everything they do. That's what's threatening everyone about organizations like Amazon. They can come in and with data and tech, outlearn their competition. That's pretty exciting, I think. Okay. Now we're trying to do this in healthcare. And I think another thing you need to be aware of in healthcare is although the policies of the last 10 years have been incredibly well-meaning, they have made data a four-letter word to many clinicians. We're entering into a hostile environment. Why is that? You know, Whole Foods goes, Amazon goes out and buys Whole Foods. I don't think it's because they want to be in the low-margin grocery business. I think they found the data and access to that customers and their data so valuable that it made sense for them to add that data to their portfolio. In healthcare, we have data, but it's been used as a cudgel to beat up on clinicians as part of what we've been calling value-based contracts. For every value-based contract you're a part of, now the clinicians are beholden to meeting certain performance standards across any number of categories. Because value-based care is not one thing, it can be in any one primary care physician practice, you can have five contracts like this, each one of which is introducing another 20 to 80 quality measures that you are responsible for. Measurement is not a means to an end in healthcare. Measurement is the end. And that's created a bit of a, a, bit of a, a logic. On top of the need to perform against all of these predetermined metrics, usually by a third party, usually by the federal government, we have to, we have to get this information from somewhere. So we layer it onto our electronic health records. Whether an EHR is different than data and different than technology doesn't matter. Perception is reality. You're entering into an environment that was promised 10 years ago that the adoption of electronic health records would make them better at their job, would streamline their workflows, would improve the health of their patients. He's done none of those things. The latest study suggested that 16 minutes per visit is now added on in having to do the sort of manual labor working with 
electronic health records. Um, so, overpromise, hype, no way to talk about it, plus we hate data and technology, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but plus we have beaten up clinicians with data and technology. Um, the next opportunity, the next big thing I wish I had learned earlier, and I think a lot of people are learning the hard way now, is we need to rethink the work in light of what is now possible. So um, back in Boston, I, if, if my, my colleague Bob Tavares is watching this, he is cringing with the fact that I have put this on the screen. He hates it. He thinks it's too technical, and you always lose people with this. But I said, I'm at Stanford. Like, if I can geek out about one thing in one place, so I'll try it with you guys, and you can just like, give me a thumbs up or thumbs down after we do this. Uh, researchers in the 70s and 80s discovered a phenomenon. Basically, when we first started being introduced to enterprise-scale technology designed to make us more productive, organizations that were adopting these technologies became less productive. As far out as 18, 24 months, they were bringing in technology to improve productivity, and it was lowering their productivity. And the researchers studied this IT productivity paradox, and what they found, and this, I think this is perfectly common sense, as humans, when we're introduced to a new capability, we tend to apply it in the old way, right? We are incremental beings in nature. And so uh, an example is the Internet comes up, and what does Blockbuster do with the Internet? Who was alive then? <laughs> <laughs> so Blockbuster, <laughs> Blockbuster goes ahead and they say, wow, the ability to communicate with our customers. Let's show them the new releases that are coming out and let's tell them how much they owe us in late fees. <laughs> right? It, this, this is like a natural, they were in the business of hosting just the new releases and they were in the business of collecting late fees. When you have kept the VHS tape at your house and made it long, right? Or the DVD as it, as it evolved. Um, Netflix said, look, we, we have the internet. It is unlimited, unlimited catalog capability. We can host any title in the world. We can mail it to people. They can send it back. Once we have that data, we can start to learn from that data. And from those learnings, we can make recommendations. So they rethought the business model in light of the new capability. That's the opportunity. That's what these organizations have figured out how to do. Some of them were built on these very capabilities. Some of them have had to learn how to do that. But in any case, success with a new capability comes down to rethinking what's possible in light of that capability. We're not doing that in healthcare. And I'll just give you a very quick example. Uh, show of hands, if everyone's familiar with you, like what care management is in healthcare. Okay, so we'll just very quickly, for those who may be a little bit less familiar, the idea behind care management is there are certain people within our population that could use more attention outside of the clinic or hospital to keep them from having untoward events, to keep them from having admissions that were preventable in some way, shape, or form. So we hire a bunch of nurses, and so in some cases, social workers. Typically, we give them a telephone bank. In some cases, we send them into homes. But the idea behind it is, you know, the sickest of the sick could probably use a little bit more attention to keep them out of the hospital. That's, that's care management. And when value-based care started to become a thing, obviously we did this back in the 80s as part of HMOs, but then fee-for-service kind of took over again, and then value-based care came in, and care management has become in vogue again. There's a lot of health plans, and even ACOs are investing in this idea of, you know, the super utilizers, the sickest of the sick, need our attention outside of the clinic. So, uh, uh, <laughs> Some people are laughing because maybe they've been like reading the headlines lately. Mm -hmm. But the Cameron Coalition was one of these organizations that has taken on caring for an incredibly difficult, or, you know, a really challenged population. And they, have, they are one of the organizations that is credited with popularizing the power of care management because they hotspotted the super utilizers. And my, my former colleague, uh, Atul Gwande, uh, wrote this article and it got a lot of attention because the Camden Coalition showed that they could reduce readmissions by 38% by finding the sickest of the sick and managing their care. So what's happening now? Care management is back in vogue, we have data, we have machine learning. We're applying a new capability in an old way. We're saying, hey, I can build a better risk score. I've got, I've got a risk score to find your super utilizers, but now I'm rolling in social determinants or EHR data. I can find the even more sickest of the sick for you to care for. 
Let's re-examine the inherent assumptions in care management. Number one, in order for that to be valuable, care management, whatever that is, needs to work. Number two, we are assuming, whether right or wrong, that costing the most is the same as needing the most help, or being most likely to benefit at the least. And finally, because of the way we have studied care management in the past, we look at that population of people at the height of their risk, then we do care management, and then we measure six months, a year later. Were they as sick? Are they as sick now as they were before? These are the baked in any design, whether a chemical design or mathematical design, there are always design assumptions built in. These are the design assumptions behind care management to date. And then, last week, two weeks ago, kudos to the Camden Coalition for having uh, the, the wherewithal and the commitment to partnering with MIT, uh, Amy Finkelstein, to do a real randomized <coughs> controlled trial to understand whether or not hot spotting and care management made a difference. And probably this goes without saying, but a randomized controlled trial, instead of just saying the same population before and after, we're saying you get the care, you don't, even though you look the same. You get the care, you don't. And then we track the people who got the care and the people that did not. And what they found was there was no discernible difference for the people who got the care and the people that did not. And this is called into question whether or not hot spotting is the right way to do this. Now we're starting to wonder, is it the, is it the most expensive that benefit from this kind of care? And right around the same time, my friend, Dr. C. Ed Obermeyer, who's at UCB, some of you may know, I think a couple months before this came out, he released a great study which showed that just organizing people based on who is the sickest of the sick actually introduces an unintentional racial bias because we spend more money on white people than we do on black people. And so sicker black people are not prioritized in the way that expensive white people are. That, look, this is tough news for the traditional way of doing things, but it's fantastic that we now have the data and increasing value-based contracts and attention to these issues so we can re-examine whether or not these are something we can rethink the work in light of what's now possible. We can apply this idea of analyzing and predicting and personalizing, and we can move away from let's find the sickest of the sick to doing what Amazon has been doing to us or Facebook as consumers forever, which is you're not all the same. Like you have different needs. You may at this moment in time benefit from a behavioral health intervention. You might be nearing end of life, and we should talk to you about palliative care, specialty palliative care, goals-based conversations. No doctor considers every patient to be exactly the same, and yet, inherent in the old way of doing things is the assumption that you're all the same. You cost a lot, you're all the same. Same intervention, same population. So I think we have a fantastic opportunity to begin to re-examine that. And one of the things we have learned is, you know, if you're just doing this sort of hot spotting risk score and then you just send people off into the wild, if your goal is impact, begin to measure what happens next. Not in the pre-post a year later, but in every project that I've been a part of since I you know, moved out of research and started to do the, the sort of work with care management teams and, and the sort of uh, you know, the business thing, if you can't help the team understand what happened after the algorithm, numerator, denominator, how many people did you outreach to? How many enrolled? What happened after they enrolled? Compared to a control group, did it work or did it not group? It did not work. This is not sexy, this is just reporting. <laughs> All right, but but in a field where reporting has meant you know punitive sort of cudgel like beating up the doc, it takes a lot to get a clinical team to sit down and walk you through what is the outcome that really matters, and then to work that back through what are the activities that help me get there. And I found without this, it is really hard to turn machine learning into impact. You really have to then measure what what happens next. I have a very quick question. Sure. So the Camden approach, do you think their inference is wrong then, or did they work and something didn't work later? Was there a difference? I don't know that well. Well, when we don't know either. I think this, you know, um, actually, like in, in this piece, which was just published yesterday, I kind of uh, dive into it a little bit more if anyone has like that subject that I just went into, you want a slightly deeper dive into that this is. But I, I think it may be a combination of things. So Kaiser Permanente just published a thing in the Harvard Business Review. I look forward to finding the, the study that caused them to say this, but in HBR anyway, it was really nice. It was common sense. They basically said when we looked at our super utilizers, there were three categories. Um, there were there were you know people that were going to de-escalate. There were people that you probably couldn't help, and then there was a sort of rising risk that we think we can make a difference with. 
and they designed their care management program around that. So I think I think that that's part of it. I also think we have a huge problem where we say care management. We don't know what that means. Like there's no milligram amount. We don't like, and it it's it's made us a little bit like shirk away from helping organizations with care management because we can't. We can't do this. Like we can't measure what they're doing because care management is this sort of amorphous intervention for everyone who is sick. And it makes it hard to really improve. Yeah, question. It's interesting when you mentioned this assumption yeah. that targeting the sickest of the sick, the highest utilizers, would actually be high yield. It reminds me of uh, some experiences that UCSF actually had when they were trying to they deployed a pilot trying to see uh, identify who would be the no shows, who would have the highest risk of no showing to clinic, yeah. right? And the initial assumption was that, if, well, if you identify the people who are at highest risk, you would reach out to them and you would save money and all that stuff. But it turns out that that didn't do anything because they would have no-showed anyway. You could reach out to them as much as you want, but they still wouldn't come. But it was actually the intermediate risk group that, that if you reach out to them, that has the most benefit. Sorry, it's my fault for breaking the ice. I don't want to ask too many questions right now. Okay. I, let I think you're right. Yep. Even, in, even in care, I think rising and intermediate is different. And I, I think that's a theme that we're going to see more and more. But I, this is work that's been done very recently is great because it forces us to re-examine our assumptions. And in this article, I make the case that let's not like look for the better risk scores. Let's get back to analyze and predict and personalize. Let's be smarter about who we're going after. Um, okay, next one. Uh, so James Carville is leading uh, Clinton. I mean, I put this one up there. One of the younger people on my team was like, oh, they don't even remember. They're not going to know about Clinton. And, 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 and I don't care. So, so, so uh, you know, it, it's the economy is stupid became like the Clinton campaign's mantra. There's a million issues that are keeping America from getting ahead. And Carville said to Clinton and all of the campaign staff, it's the economy is stupid. Here in healthcare, it's the economic stupid. If you want to point to one thing that keeps machine learning from really making a huge impact, it's not the education, it's not the lack of data, it's not the bias, it's not anything that's been discussed, it's the economics. Um, I'm absolutely convinced of this, and the reason why is this. To survive, I've worded this very carefully, to survive a fee-for-service care delivery organization, an organization that gets its money from volume and complexity, cannot afford to invest in technology that keep people out of their hospitals, right? Um, now, every time I say this, I qualify, I've never met an executive or a clinician that went into business to try to make a ton of money and, and like get people really sick. It's not that, it's that we've created this system that literally does not allow any CFO or CEO of a hospital to really change behavior in a meaningful way if the way they get paid is based on volume and complexity. And that is still how 9 plus percent of care in the U.S. is delivered today. So do not mistake me, AI will make a big difference in fee-for-service care. It'll be applied, now again, this is why we can't just say AI and look at the product. It'll be applied to the very specific application of increasing the volume and complexity of care. It'll be to, to do no-shows and to keep that operating room running smooth. It'll be to go through the electronic health records. Nick, I'm giving you a great quote today that I hadn't heard before. It'll do no code left behind. <laughs> That's how, I can tell you right now, those are the most lucrative applications of machine learning and healthcare in the fee-for-service market today. I love this quote. I go to it every time I'm trying to figure out whether or not we should work with an organization that says they're taking on risk. Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. I think the other thing is, I mean, I've heard this one, I thought it's great. Value-based care is easy. It's transitioning to value-based care that's hard. So right now, there are probably a dozen flavors of value-based care. Some of them are not value-based care, right? An ACO that has zero downside risk, so no matter how much you spend, you'll never get things for it, and plus two upside if you save some money. A clinician that is seeing 20 patients a day, three of which are part of that ACO contract, 12 of which are part of a commercial contract, this guy is part of a Medi you know, Medicare Advantage contract. If you're not all in, on trying to save money and keep people out of the hospital. If you have like nine different incentive structures behind the scenes while you're seeing patients, the organization is not going to achieve real behavior change. So we have incentive-ish, like we're still getting to the point that we have the incentive we need to go all in and start really changing behavior with intent to keep people healthy and out of the hospital. 
the evolution is happening, but we're not all the way there yet. And so executives in different healthcare organizations are trying to decide. Like it's getting warm, that's kind of nice, but when do you jump out of the water? It's the same debate that every organization faces in an industry where change is coming. And I'm, I'm convinced that more and more they'll have to jump out of the water. I, I heard that very recently Stanford's medical center is now taking on, like, I don't know if the number 24,000 patients under risk, but as you take on more and more risk, you create real incentive to use machine learning to keep people out of the hospital. All right, so this next part is, I knew that I was talking to folks that are going to be making career decisions, and I'm going to do my best to corrupt you in the right direction. Um, what advice to those looking to use machine learning to improve healthcare? Number one, there is not a healthcare industry. There's probably 35 healthcare industries. Most of them are in direct competition with one another. The pharmaceutical manufacturer makes money when you take more drugs. The insurance company loses money. Understand the incentives of the organization you dedicate your talents to because it will determine the types of projects and goals that you work toward. Just be very clear. The question I would encourage each one of you to ask is, what keeps the CFO of the company I have joined up at night? If it's not seeing enough patients, and you've got to be really honest about that, just know your skills will be used to make sure that he sleeps better at night, or she. If, if it's spending too much money on patients that we could have got to sooner with a lower level of care, that's how your talents will be dedicated. And I, I, I say you have to be, because remember, we're transitioning to value-based care, and some are putting out press releases, but 95% of their revenues don't come back. <laughs> so you have to be very careful about where you commit your talents, if, again, impact is your goal. Uh, next one. Uh, you should all know this by now. Uh, one does not simply drop off a predictive model. The predictive model is at best a suggestion. <laughs> it is not a solution. It does. It's, a predictive model has never healed anybody. It's the action you take afterwards. So, so start to train yourself now as to how to talk about the, all those things I mentioned earlier, like knowing how to talk about it, knowing how to work with clinicians. I would, Are you suggesting we drop we we dump machine learning in, into the mouth? Uh, no. Okay. I would avoid it if at all possible. Uh, yeah, in fact, that's my only like Lord of the Rings. Uh, Prior talks have had more. Uh, <laughs> I was in a very large, you know the brand name, one of these health plans that was creating an AI team for the first time, and you know my company was in there talking to them, and we were exchanging notes about what they're doing and what we had been doing, and we mentioned that we had done some work around um, member retention, understanding when a, uh, a member of a health plan was thinking about leaving. It, the data scientist, yeah, we've done that too. I said, really? Yeah. He, you know, he quoted the area of RFC. He was very proud of the performance. And I said, so how'd it work out? You know, I just told you, the area under RFC was this. And I said, no, no, I mean, how many members did you? And he said, he said, well, it's not the data scientist's fault if the business doesn't adopt the, the product. And I, I said, well, maybe not for long. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, have, you just, you get the point. You just have to be cognizant of the fact that what you're doing doesn't mean a thing unless you're now coupled with a team that can take action. This, I never thought I would say. Um, if, again, your goal is impact and you're on the care delivery side of things, it turns out that healthcare is not a free market economy. Um, in healthcare, policy eats culture and strategy for breakfast. Policy dictates how you get paid for what you get paid. If your goal is to help a clinical team keep people healthy and out of the hospital, you need to map that back to the very specific contract that they signed up for, offered by CMS, because it has very specific criteria, and if you know those criteria, if you can say to them, actually, the reason why this predictive model is so important is because if you keep patients in your palliative care program for more than eight months, you're not gonna be eligible for the withhold. Okay, now you're talking the CFO's <laughs> language. If you say, I can predict who needs a transfer, <laughs> right? So um, I was amazed. And by the way, I will say this, CMS does a really nice job in their RFPs of writing up their policy. Okay, I think the first time I read one, I was like, this isn't so bad, right? So I would say if you're going to be in the business of helping, particularly on the care delivery side, invest in understanding what is keeping the CFO up at night and its policy, typically by CMS or by the payer, right? If they've got to deal with 
Heather, Humana, there are criteria in there that are keeping them up at night. Speak their language, you're in a better position to help them achieve their goals. Uh, we see this all the time. You know, the company that I formed is now, you know, at first we were machine learning, right? Uh, this is four and a half years ago, and over time we realized, chase the risk. The more risk you have, the closer you get to true capitated care, meaning I'm going to give you a fixed amount of money with which you will succeed or fail the further you are from just being able to write like um, those compliance related queries, the more you have to figure out how to discover efficiency and report whether or not you're meeting your goals. And that's all the way out here. And if, again, getting back to knowing the policy, if you understand the specifics of those policies, then you can position yourself to be most helpful. And, that, and as you go toward full capitation, you know, you, you can't get away with just queries or just generic risk scores and the superpowers that you've been working to develop suddenly you know, put you in a position to save lives and improve health care. The awesome thing about this that I did not anticipate going into it was because the federal government makes the policy and is pushing everybody on the risk thing and the federal government happens to pay for the care of older and sicker and poorer people, even though it's the fancy institutions that are publishing the papers and getting the press, it turns out it's the organizations that care for the sickest of the sick that are actually adopting this stuff. Nearly every one of our contracts is driven by the government, which is telling us to take care of sicker, poorer people, which is awesome. Like This lines up perfectly with our altruistic nature as young people looking to change the world with machine learning. Uh, I never saw that coming. By the way, when I did see it coming, I reached out to Christina Thar at CNBC and I was like, Chrissy, you've got to pay attention to this. Like, like poor, sicker, older people are getting the AI. And uh, it was a moonshot, and she's like, yeah, I'd like to hear about that, which is, which is awesome. Um, all right, last, last story, last lesson. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Dr. Ernest Codman. Ernest Codman. Anyone? And surprising because he is credited on his gravestone as being the father of outcomes assessment and quality management. <coughs> Dr. Carvin came into practice. He was a Harvard graduate. He came into practice at Mass General Hospital at the turn of the century. In the early 1900s, he was a practicing surgeon. Dr. Carvin had a crazy idea. He suggested that if we collected the before, the during, and the after, what are we doing? Is it working? Then we can answer the question, what should we be doing? And he created what he calls his end results system. It was the very first patient reported outcomes measure, right? And so for every, sur every surgery he did, he captured the patient's details, and he captured what he did and why he did it. And then he insisted on following up with that patient for at least one year. The end results system. Um, Dr. Coffin believed vehemently that if you don't know what you did, and if it worked, how do you get better? How do, how do you know if you're doing the right thing by these patients that you're cutting open and sending home? Well, he was shunned for his ideas. He was, in fact, fired by Mass General Hospital because he continued to advocate that not only this data be collected, but it be shared with the public so they can make better decisions about whether or not they should have surgery and who they should have it with. He showed up at a meeting having hired an illustrator to create this poster. <laughs> now, put yourself at that point in time, right? If you think medicine is hierarchical now, <laughs> uh, imagine being a surgeon back then in the most prestigious surgical institution, at least in this country, and standing up in front of a group of people and showing an illustration that on the left has the board of trustees asking if that, will the patients, if we let her know the truth about our patients, do you suppose she would still be willing to lay? This is an ostrich slash golden goose, very smart, right? The ostrich has its head in the sand, it is ignoring the results of the work it's doing, and it is firing golden eggs at the outstretched arms of the surgical team. Boom. Like when I heard about this guy, I was like, wow. <laughs> uh, so, Dr. Kahneman continued to pursue this, this end. He is now, he's credited not only for the first patient reported outcomes measure, but uh, his work in the organization that he formed became the American College of Surgeons. He actually had the idea that became the Joint Commission, or JCO, the thing that makes every hospital scared because they come in. Despite that, he never really achieved his position, right? Right now, if someone you love goes to have surgery, are you able to ask that surgeon or that institution whether or not that surgeon has good outcomes? 
Does that surgeon know whether or not they have good outcomes? They always do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in this country, we don't want to ask how many people die as a result of medical error. Right? I think it's a real travesty. Because the Institute of Medicine said in like 98, as part of two errors human, they estimated that the number of people that die each year by medical error is 98,000 people. And then in 2014 or 15, the Journal of Patient Safety revised that number. 200,000 people die by medical error each year. That was the lower bound of their estimate. The upper bound of their estimate was 400,000 people dying each year by preventable error. And what happened after that got published? The medical community attacked. They said, what is preventable? How could you do this? And, and if the debate was around whether or not that number was real. There was never an outrage or a debate as to why our margin of error was like 200,000. Why don't we bother to count the number of people that die by accident each year? That's what has to change, right? If we get data, if we get tech, if we get incentive, we have the opportunity to start making change. On his gravestone, not only does it credit him with being the father of modern outcomes measurement, a quote from the good Dr. Codman is, it may take a hundred years for my ideas to be accepted. By the way, this gravestone was erected in 2014. He died so poor that his family couldn't afford to put a gravestone up. That, that is not three miles from the New England Baptist Hospital. The New England Baptist Hospital has been approached by payers, employers, to enter into value-based contracts for the first time. And what they realized in sitting down and negotiating with these payers is that value-based means I will guarantee you a certain amount of volume, you will lower your price. They argued, we deliver more valuable care. The employer said, prove it. They couldn't. Nobody captures the data to know whether or not these things even work. So how could they prove it? So a very enterprising, innovative Dr. Scott Tromenhauser is the CMO of the institution. We sat down and started talking about the work. Is he a role model for us or not? Do we want to, do we, should, we don't want to die, die in poverty. <laughs> this guy? Mom, Louis, it's a setup. Let me show you. <laughs> hundred years later, uh, Dr. Tromenhauser, uh, I give a talk at the New England Baptist, he explained that, you know, getting pressed with all the wrong things when it comes to value. So I said, well, let's, let's talk about that. If you go and look at the literature, the little data that has been collected that, that tells us whether or not people benefit from a total knee replacement surgery, it turns out 22% of all people that have that $25,000 surgery experience no benefit one year later in terms of pain or function. A quarter of all the knee replacement surgeries don't actually lead to improvement, or at least one year later. Um, that's $4 billion worth of waste. We started to look at the data. We showed them for the first time that their surgeons, you know, not everyone is above average, and we started to share that and circulate it amongst the surgeons. And we decided together that we could use the before, during, and after data to help patients and doctors make informed decisions. What are we doing? Is it working? What should we be doing? So they happen to have been collecting patient-reported outcomes measures for about a year and a half as part of a research project. So we looked at that and we said, can we build a machine learning model that can predict if you have this surgery, how likely are you to be better, the same, or worse? Pretty straightforward. And so built an iPad once we learned what questions do we need answered. So a patient goes in for an initial consult, answers 60 seconds worth of questions, by the time they go into the operating room, there's a piece of paper that has been printed out. It goes in with the surgeon and the patient, and the surgeon and the patient have a conversation about their needs, about their situation, about their desires, but also, and this is a real patient who gives us permission to use this, and that's Dr. Carl Palmo, who uses this on a daily basis now. Also, they show them, this is your likelihood, right? Based on patients like you, the patient the doctor have the conversation, the patient makes a decision, and we follow up a year later. Before, during, and after, for the first time, that surgical, that group of surgeons, the academically minded, published the fact that, hey, we're not all the same. We don't all get great outcomes. And in fact, in doing so, it's not because we have different patients. It's not because they're significantly older or have different comorbidities. We just aren't perfect at what we do. And they, they published this. They presented this at the Knee Society up in Maine this summer. And so the point is, because of this trifecta, data, technology, now really for the first time in the centers. Whereas before, this kind of work was impossible. Now it's just hard. And hard is okay, right? Hard is why it's so great that all of you are entering into this field to dedicate your superpower to keeping people healthy. But just, you know, keep in mind, there's lots of ways to use machine, machine learning in healthcare. 
Um, but you've got to be a little bit more deliberate if you want to use it to have an impact. So that's it. That's the fast. That's the fast track lessons learned. Uh, that's my contact information. Uh, it's a very sincere offer. If I can help anyone think through how to make an impact in their career using data for healthcare, I, I always respond to inquiries like that. So, so please, um, thank you very much for your time and attention. I like all your points. I don't know that, that I don't agree that this is after the algorithm. It sounds like a lot of this is before the algorithm. But so so you don't want to go ahead and do a bunch of collect data and, and build a drinking model without knowing in advance that you you, have, you think you know how it's going to get used effectively, right? So it's not it's not really after the algorithm. Very valid. Okay. I agree completely. Yes. Sir. So there is there is two things that. Um, it's, uh, I usually, um, usually people don't mention the, the concept of USA, like, um, yeah, there is a lot of poor outcomes, but there is, there is one thing that I think is being analyzed. Do the U.S. population actually uh, do things to get healthier, like a decision? Because all these high risks you are mentioning that they have no benefit is like, if I don't want to get healthy, if I want to feel if I want a new replacement, because when a new replacement, even if it doesn't work anything, I just want a new replacement, because you need to give me a new replacement, like in talent culture and all of that. Like the analysis of why maybe things are not impacting is because this culture maybe is not doing what it needs to a culture. It's not the healthcare needs to be done to get healthier. So like it's it's a it's, it's sort of a thing that usually is not mentioned because oh we are we need to be sensitive with patients but I know a lot of cases that have come to the United States of people with really bad conditions and in front in their desk in their desk I think that actually deteriorated their conditions. You said that last part again. Like people like that had really bad conditions yeah. and in their desk are their offices are things that actually deteriorate the condition further. Mm. People with diabetes with a jar full of sugar. Sure. <laughs> so, that, and it's not just one people. Yep. So, so I, I agree completely. Solving yeah. healthcare is multifaceted, and there's no question that uh, the American society does not contribute to the great outcomes that we get. Are you a great point? I agree with you. Um, as, like, as, as researchers in informatics, um, what are the open research questions, uh, if any, in the after the algorithm part? Yeah. Um, yeah. Open questions. I've been a terrible researcher for the last 10 years. Um, I've been very fortunate that some of the people we work with, take, they really care and they take the time to publish. Um, I think the open questions, you know, there's a lot of work around implementation science, there's a lot of work around behavior modification, how do incentives change what people do. I think that gets directly to the point that you make, incentives leading to better decisions. Um, I'm sure there's all kinds of really interesting work related to getting the math right and better. I think for me, though, the most interesting area is we've got the math, but is it focused at the right thing? And I love every study that goes beyond the F measure or the P value. I, I love to see the number of patients helped or not. Uh, and I think, to me, the most exciting area is when teams come together and do that. I thought the Finkelstein work with the Cameron Coalition, like, they deserve whatever honors are available for a, a team coming together and using better math and addressing a very, I think a Cameron Coalition from a marketing standpoint has benefited from some time for the attention that they got and that they would have the fortitude to challenge that and to understand what really did or didn't work, I think is great. So that, that's the kind of research that I think is really important. That's just my opinion, of course. Sorry. So excellent presentation. But one thing I think you haven't stressed enough is the diversity and the uh, disparities in the data you're putting in. Sure. Uh, so we know that if you put in biased data, your AI is going to give you a perfection of the bias. So that's one thing that has to be addressed. Second, the use of race alone is a very controversial issue because race can imply many things. So black, African American can imply lower education, social economic status, access to care. So putting in race without controlling for the 
confounding factors can lead to erroneous decision making. So those two things really have to be addressed. I think the biased data is what we got. And how are you going to unbias it? So people at Stanford are working on algorithms to say, let's see if we can correct for or adjust for the bias, but I don't see any concrete results yet. I agree completely. In fact, I was, when I was just talking to Nick before he came in here, I said, you know, increasingly, um, I think when you start as a young informatics researcher, you want to create the master algorithm, the master open source product, where the technology just solves the problem. And I think increasingly what we realize is to make it matter, it's this combination of tools and people. And I think that moving away from this idea that install a better machine learning risk score uh, and more toward, hey, we have a very specific problem here and my data is not the same and my patients are not the same and I need to evaluate this to figure out if it actually solves my problem and whether or not it's introducing unintended bias is probably the right way to do this. I think that healthcare is used to purchasing product and installing product and throwing it over the fence where the care managers can ignore it safely. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I agree with what you're saying. That's, that's how I see it. Kevin is actually a really good case in point. I, I, I know some people who, in, I think they're the Blue Lodge people, same people who work on political campaigns, and, and the initial impact largely resulted because they found a large subpopulation of essentially single moms with kids with asthma who showed up in the ED all the time, yeah. and they very specifically started addressing those to keep them out of the ED, you know, just give them inhalers, give them primary care, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Okay, they skimmed that cream. And then afterwards, you get a bunch of people with coronary artery disease and diabetes and, and <laughs> the CHF and whatever, right? Yeah, good luck keeping those out of the hospital. It's a lot harder. I think the, the lesson there, and I don't hammer it too hard on this, is it's not one size fits all. If there is a subpopulation that can benefit from a known intervention, design the intervention, dedicate the resources. Uh, but I think it's great because the, the lessons from other industries sort of validate that. Right? I mean, what, what have we seen over and over again? Data makes the world smart and more actionable. It just healthcare has to adopt that philosophy. Yes. I really like your point about the need to rethink work and in light of what's possible in the sense that, you know, we probably don't know what the thing that's enabled by AI will look like, right? Like, we think we do, and that's why we haven't really been able to do that much. And something that we're definitely thinking about is, like, what does that thing actually look like? Because we know that machine learning is a tool, is something that is not the end. It enables something else that will be better. And the initial experiences of uh, these, like, better risk models but plugged into existing workflows just don't really work well. I'm just kind of curious, have you been able to identify, I don't know, some even some characteristics describing this new thing that is now enabled by AI? And obviously, we don't have the answers yet, but what have you found so far? Um, I, just to carry on to what we were just saying, mm -hmm. um, if AI is good at you know, personalizing, predicting, and making a one-size-fits-all thing more actionable, I think where we've seen success just in the work that we've been doing is moving away from generic, moving toward very specific interventions, where the clinicians say, yes, th this is a group that I know what to do. Uh, the literature shows that when you do this thing and do it well, there is an opportunity. You can multiply that by some kind of an ROI. I didn't talk about this much, but like the language of improvement in healthcare, the language of change in healthcare is dollars and cents, right? So if you can be more specific on the intervention, get a team to agree that if I did a better job of this, I could make an impact, and then measure the heck out of it before, during, and after, we've, we have seen teams go off and start to do things differently, and we've seen early data that it might make a difference, and then you gotta follow that all the way out to figure out whether or not ultimately you have saved money, reduced admissions and the like. It's not easy. So as I said, there are better ways to make money. <laughs> yeah, I mean also you highlight this tension of, of you know the need to measure outcomes, but then that's exactly what the EHR tried to do over the last ten years, right? And we often attribute some of the reasons why the EHR sucks so much is that it forces us to measure things by plugging in data. So right. Yeah, I mean, it's wondering, you know, like you talk about, well, we talk about the need for these outcomes, and then you go to the quality department, they're like, well, we tried that for the last eight years, and they hate us, so what can we do differently now? Right? Yeah, I think that's always been a tension with measurement, right, in education and other fields where we all agree we need to do a better job, but then you, you dictate what those measures are, and they have to be common denominator. You have to first you have the data that, do you have the data that everyone else has? Because you can't measure something. I think NISQIP and AHRT, like everyone is, plagued with the idea of the, the problem, you can only measure what everyone has the data for, and that limits your measures. 
and you can't really account for specialized institutions and subpopulations and so on and so forth. So this tension between measurement and measuring the same thing for everyone is like a consistent theme in society over and over again. Right? What we've sort of done is said, what's the outcome? Right? Like, what is good? And then, okay, so what activities do you need to invest in to get to good? And then you measure that. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. We get the last two in the back and then we'll start to break. I wanted to comment or underscore on this notion, this idea that when we automate what we're already doing, there's potential benefit, yeah. but it's really not transformative in any way. And the real question and the power comes from asking, what can we do now that we couldn't before? And that automating a nurse to call the person by better identifying which person to call is nice, but how about using the technology and the AI and bringing data together to accomplish something that doesn't require a person? Now suddenly, because you can do that at scale, you can start reaching populations that could not previously be reached. So are you suggesting, sir, that you are a huge proponent of the IT productivity paradox? <laughs> <laughs> Bob, I don't know if you're listening. This crowd loves the IT productivity paradox. <laughs> I, I, was, I was more trying to point out that there's op we need to be thinking about things that couldn't be done before. That's correct. And being clever, working with. Uh, unfortunately, it can't be done just with an AI team interacting with a team that already has a, a plan. That's right. right? I agree. It requires forward-looking what is possible and ideation around what can we do at scale right. earlier down the chain, if you will, of the healthcare problem development that will have a greater impact. Great. Particularly when you look at the fact that the world is running around with a computing device connected on the network in their hands. And we're sending faxes are back and forth. The opportunities are limitless and the real value and the real impact is going to have when we figure out how to deliver at scale AI-driven solutions that guide people. It has nothing to do with that scale. That's way really over, over subscribed, sorry. The point is that when you use AI-based technologies, you can deliver smaller increments of value to larger numbers of people. That's fine. Great. That's what I mean by at scale. We'll give the last question to a student, Shane. You want yeah. to take it? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, like, the, you know, the, the payment system for a country, healthcare payment system, whether it's universal healthcare, private insurance, things like a very political topic. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned, like, the incentives when in fee-for-service model, right? Like, basically, it will never be aligned to actually value the patient's health. Yeah. Well, the way, the way that, that yeah. like, because the bottom line is, uh, you know, you need volume, you need right. uh, to charge um, uh, uh, for your procedures. Yeah. So, like, you just have to maximize that. And um, so I guess I'm curious about what your perspective is on, like, do you think based on, on that conclusion that you can yeah. logically argue that, you know, the ideal system should be at and, and what's your perspective on that? Yeah, thanks for trying to give me a step on the third rail. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I will not prescribe the program, but I will say, and I, I have seen this, but look, my company only, people are paying me to help them identify people that would benefit from earlier care. And the only people that are paying me to help keep people healthy before they crash are people that have real financial risk if you end up in the hospital. Yeah, I think all of this startup, anyone who's doing you know, health IT, health, whatever you're calling it, digital health, anyone that's doing that with an eye toward keeping people healthy to save money is doing it, you know, they're selling to the employers, they're selling to the health plans, and they're selling to these provider groups that are taking on real financial risk to keep your spend down. So whatever acronym they put in front of the system or systems that win, the more financial risk you carry to keep people at home and healthy, the more likely you are to do that. Now, I'm not so naive to believe that there isn't a downside to that because if you get a fixed amount of money to operate with, now you have the incentive to ration care. So it's not easy, right? I don't want to be up here and say, like, just go toward value-based care and you solve everything. Uh, but I can tell you what we're doing is broken for sure. There's no, you don't spend more money than anyone in the world, uh, both a total dollar and GDP ratio, and deliver really low quality outcomes based on others. You don't do that with a system that has its incentives a lot. Is that a cop out or is that a useful answer? What about both? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Because I think like the can say you should have to go about it.